Hello and welcome to South Asia Chat, a podcast series brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. My name is Saeeduddin Faridi. I'm a research analyst at ISAS and I will be your host for today's episode on green hydrogen in India. There is a lot of optimism around green hydrogen as a source of energy which can enable India's decarbonization plans and at the same time help it become an energy independent country. Green hydrogen is a zero carbon fuel generated by splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen through the use of renewable energy. India's fast growing renewable energy capacity coupled with aspirations of building a self-reliant economy has created an opportune moment to explore green hydrogen as a fuel. To this effect, the Indian government earlier in January of this year launched the National Green Hydrogen Mission, which outlines an action plan to create a green hydrogen ecosystem in the country. India is one among many other developing countries such as Chile and Argentina who have expressed ambitious plans for for green hydrogen. In India, several major investments in green hydrogen have, all, have been announced by companies looking for answers to long-standing problems like intermittency of renewables and energy storage. To delve deeper into the opportunities and challenges of green hydrogen, today we have with us Mr. Hemant Malia, fellow at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water in New Delhi. Mr. Malia has extensively published on hydrogen and energy with his experience spanning energy markets, energy efficiency, environment and climate change. At CEEW, he is leading efforts to analyze the potential for a hydrogen-based economy and its associated policy needs. Mr. Malia, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Sir. Uh, starting with uh, how green hydrogen is emerging as uh, an, an important fuel for the 21st century, what are, are the opportunities that it offers, and what explains the optimism around it? So, um, green hydrogen is being looked at primarily as a consequence of you know climate change. So, post the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, several countries have committed to net zero, and so has India last year. Uh, we have committed to a net zero by 2070, and so that. you know raises the question as to how are we going to decarbonize uh, for the for power sector it's obvious that we are going to use renewable uh, energy but what happens to all the other industrial sectors uh, that need to be decarbonized especially when india is trying to grow as an economy primarily through manufacturing so i think climate change has been the primary trigger uh, it's not that hydrogen is an unknown uh, energy vector it has been in use for decades now uh, however two factors are enabling the potential for transition to green hydrogen uh, primary amongst them is uh, the lower cost of renewable energy primarily uh, solar and wind so in the past 3 to 5 years uh, the tariffs on solar especially have drastically dropped where now uh, in most parts of the country uh, renewable energy through solar or renewable power i should say uh, is substantially cheaper than even coal based power and therefore uh that is a, a, a key input into making green hydrogen so for those who don't know what green hydrogen is uh, you use uh, renewable power to electrolyze water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen and the resultant hydrogen is known as green hydrogen so renewable power is the uh, key input uh, you know in terms of cost so the prices have been dropping there and we further expect uh, prices to drop as technology on photovoltaics improve and then we have a larger giga scale uh, solar parks etc so that's one um, enabler uh, the second potential enabler is going to be the manufacturing of electrolyzers themselves so traditionally uh, electrolyzers are made in batch scale which means you know in a dozen two dozen at a time uh, and therefore the costs are higher uh, if you're looking at large scale deployment of green hydrogen you're also looking at large scale manufacturing of electrolyzers Uh, and with giga factories we expect costs for electrolyzers also to come down so a couple of years ago uh, cost of electrolyzers was around 3 uh, 900 uh, usd per kilowatt roughly uh, today we are looking at 500 to 600 uh, uh, you know dollars per kilowatt and that's expected to fall further so a combination of falling renewable ener- energy prices and uh, cheaper electrolyzers will make green hydrogen a uh, potentially a key competitor to fossil fuels in the future now as far as opportunities go um, like i said 
uh, hydrogen is already being used primarily in refineries and fertilizer india uses about 5.5 million tons per annum of um, green uh, sorry gray hydrogen which is made from natural gas at this point uh, so that is an easy switch uh, or relatively easy switch so you replace your gray hydrogen with uh, green hydrogen apart from that green hydrogen is also being looked at in new areas uh, primary amongst them is steel sector so we are uh, producing about 110 to 120 million tons of uh, steel per year and we plan to double the capacity so as we double the capacity uh, the primary uh, input right now is coal as fuel uh, and you know we cannot afford to do that in the future so green hydrogen can uh, potentially play a key role in decarbonizing the new capacity uh, expansion apart from that we are looking at mobility so um, for shorter distances within cities etc uh, uh, evs are fairly uh, commercially viable and competitive with say diesel and petrol but that's not the case when you're looking at long distance heavy duty vehicles uh, there it's difficult to get in battery uh, based um you know mobility solutions and hydrogen might play a role there uh, and then finally uh, the government is also looking at blending green hydrogen and natural gas pipelines uh, so as you blend green hydrogen in the pipelines every end user automatically gets decarbonized so that's also uh, an opportunity apart from that uh, there are uh, pathways for producing marine fuel and and let's say aviation fuel again hard to abate sectors and green hydrogen can again play a role there so a lot of uh, you know new applications to look at of course there are the existing refinery and fertilizer applications anyways yes thank you for that answer uh, coming to india the indian government earlier this month announced plans to incentivize the manufacturing of electrolyzers and the generation of green hydrogen under its new a uh, national green hydrogen mission so uh, i think you touched uh, a little bit on this on in your previous answer but what do you think is india's strategic ambition to green hydrogen yeah the primary motivation i think is energy security uh, of course climate change is on an important aspect but uh, like i said we are a growing economy and so energy security is of importance especially given what we are seeing in europe uh, with the conflict between ukraine and russia um, to put things into perspective india imports about 55% of its natural gas 85% of its uh, crude oil and about 25% of its coal so we are heavily dependent on imports of energy uh, to keep our economy ticking uh, any disruptions there has a direct impact on our gdp growth Uh, that's something that we want to try and uh, cushion in the years to come so therefore there is a thrust on identifying alternatives which are um, domestic in nature so of course biomass is something that we are looking at but also uh, green hydrogen so i think that is uh, a key element uh, in how we look at green hydrogen domestically so just uh, as an example uh if we were to replace our 5.5 or 5.6 million tons of gray hydrogen uh based on natural gas today with let's say green hydrogen in 5 to 10 years time we are looking at backing out 65% plus of our lng import so that's a very significant number uh so that's how it's being looked at apart from the climate change angle itself uh apart from that i think geo strategically in the decades to come the countries that are a part of the energy supplying group will see a shift so right now you know opec rules the roast with russia to a certain extent um, the us as far as crude oil is concerned but new players will emerge in the future as far as green hydrogen and derivatives are concerned so clearly india could be one of those players but then you have new ones like australia Uh, potentially a few new ones in uh, in africa such as egypt um, uh, and so you will see a shift in how energy flows occur in the in the world in the future so that is an important element that uh, you know india and and we in the policy think tank space are looking at uh, apart from that india does see a potential if not at a large scale but at least at a certain scale uh, exporting of fuels so um like i said you know aviation fuel or marine fuel be it sustainable aviation fuel or be it green ammonia or green methanol those are potential avenues where india might see a play uh, also because we are looking at building you know our ports as well so uh, as the traffic in the indian ocean increases 
we are looking at uh, improving and increasing our port capacity port handling capacity so that allows us to potentially uh, also leverage our green hydrogen value chain uh, in india we've seen both public and private players have begun to make serious investments in green hydrogen so adani and reliance have uh, announced significant investments and public companies like iocl and gale have been running pilot projects uh, across the country uh, regarding green hydrogen supply so uh, i think uh, what uh, a question that stems from that is that what sectors are likely to create demand for green hydrogen and i th- and i think you've touched a little bit on this on in your first answer but i think uh, ex- establishing that distinction between feedstock and fuel uh, in terms of green hydrogen would be important here yeah yeah like you said at this point it's mainly used as a feedstock uh, in refineries and fertilizers especially in the fertilizer sector uh, not all of the fertilizer is urea based so uh, to put things in perspective in india urea is subsidized by the government uh, but apart from urea there are uh, other fertilizers such as diammonium phosphate uh, that does not see subsidy which means those companies have to buy natural gas at market prices Uh, which means their grey hydrogen is substantially higher priced than a fertilizer plant that is uh, getting subsidized gas. Um, so therefore, you know there are opportunities there. Uh, apart from that, a lot of ammonia does get imported. Uh, depending on the price of crude oil in the international markets, uh, green hydrogen can be competitive with imported ammonia. Uh, so those are ab- early avenues. Uh, refineries, of course, uh, it's a little bit challenging because. they already have substantial amount of uh, grey hydrogen uh, production capacity in terms of steam within reforming equipment so th- that will be a little bit challenging but then as and when uh, the price of green hydrogen uh, you know drops uh, i think there is a key motivation there to um, you know switch their grey with green hydrogen so those are potential early adopters uh but it's very hard to say how the sector will actually evolve because there are other uh, sectors that might look at green hydrogen even if it is more expensive because uh, on, from a decarbonization perspective we have to look at the marginal uh, cost of carbon dioxide as well so india is uh, looking to develop a carbon market uh, in fact uh, late last year uh, the you know upper house in india approved of development of a carbon market which means Uh, sometime soon in the next 2 to 3 years we'll start seeing a price on carbon when that happens uh, it will cushion the higher price of green hydrogen so you might see certain amount of uptake let's say in the steel industry for blending it in their fuel mix uh, you may also find uh, like i had earlier pointed out uh, in certain geographies and certain routes heavy duty vehicles you know uh, potentially using green hydrogen um the biggest challenge with hydrogen is transportation but if the volumes are small uh, and the geography is right for example in gujarat um you could produce green hydrogen such that they might it actually might be cost competitive with diesel uh, without much subsidy or governmental support so we might see some of those uh, sectors emerging as well uh and apart from that our analysis shows that uh, in distributed production and uh, consumption of hydrogen there might be potential for applications for example you know in semi rural or uh, rural areas uh, use of uh, small scale uh, hydrogen for cooking solutions for example or uh, for commercial establishments that are currently using the really high priced lpg that we import uh, and replacing that with hydrogen if they have enough rooftop space to deploy rooftop solar and combine their, uh, that or couple that with green hydrogen so those are newer applications that are very very you know uh, new to the space but could very quickly emerge as being cost competitive Uh, without having to wait for all the other elements such as you know giga factories and uh, giga scale solar parks to emerge so there there are a lot of opportunities that are being looked into um so i think in the few next few years to come there'll be clarity on uh, you know what is the scale that we can achieve in the next few years uh green hydrogen is currently priced at between uh 4 to 6 dollars per kg and you can correct me if my stat is wrong here and this makes it uh less feasible economically while there is expectation that this number will go down so uh, what are some other alternatives that india can rely on in the short and the medium term to meet its decarbonization goals yeah no that's a good question because um you know 4 dollars was probably 
six months ago, uh, we are already looking at around three dollars per kg production cost. That's not delivered. Uh, that's production cost. So costs have already fallen as uh, developers have uh, you know gotten their business models in place and and the financiers and and sourcing for electrolyzers etc. Um, so that price has already come down. Production cost rather. Um, we do anticipate that that cost will fall further uh, because we do not have the scale of demand right now. As the demand uh, or, or the market gets realized, that cost will come down. But you're right that at, even at three dollars, we are looking at uh, around on an energy basis around twenty-one, twenty-two dollars per mmbtu. That's what it translates to, uh, and it's substantially more expensive than even uh, some of the expensive natural gas. Uh, to compare it with coal, coal is around six to eight dollars per mmbtu, so roughly three times the cost of coal. Um, so on a energy on an energy basis, it's still not very competitive. It will be in the future, but that's where the conundrum is because if you don't have the scale, you don't have the cost competitiveness, and because you don't have cost competitiveness, you don't get the scale. Uh, and so therefore, we need to look at um, intermediary solution that will create the demand. Now, uh, incidentally, we have published a, a research paper only last week. Uh, I do urge your uh, listeners to go and take a look. Uh, it's on turquoise hydrogen. So basically, hydrogen made from uh, pyrolysis of natural gas. So what is that? Basically, pyrolysis means that you combust natural gas in the absence of oxygen. So conventional grey hydrogen is made by combining uh, steam, uh, which is you know H2O, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, along with uh, natural gas, which is methane, CH4. So you get CO2, which is carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, which uh, which are the product and byproduct. But in the case of natural gas pyrolysis, because there is no oxygen in the process, you get hydrogen along with solid carbon. Now, solid carbon or carbon black um, is already in use primarily in the rubber industry. Uh, and it, if we see the color of tires, for example, it's black because it, rubber is mixed along with carbon black. So this carbon black has value to it. Now, because the byproduct has value, uh, the cost of hydrogen actually comes down. Uh, and so our estimate is that with current technologies, depending on the price of gas, if it's eight to ten dollars per mmbtu, uh, and the price of uh, carbon black is let's say 30 rupees per kg which is roughly around uh, 40 cents um, uh, per kg you're looking at hydrogen cost of less than two dollars so it immediately becomes cost competitive with delivered price of natural gas uh, it's not applicable to every sector but certain sectors such as steel which can buy large quantum of natural gas or for that matter uh, let's say uh, a pipeline operator which you know is also the owner of the natural gas um, can utilize this technology the beauty of this technology also is that um, you know as the technology is being enhanced the carbon is being converted into other what we call morphologies. So carbon comes in different um, you know shapes and sizes and and uh, you know uh, and properties. Uh, for example, diamond is also you know a, a, prop, a, a carbon uh, you know element. And so uh, newer morphologies are providing the option of making useful byproducts such as graphite uh, or carbon nanotubes, which are very useful. Uh, in the green energy transition it, uh, as far as battery manufacturing goes uh, or other equipment for uh, green solutions. So these alternative morphologies have much higher value in the market. Uh, so if for example uh, a particular technology is able to produce graphite in place of carbon black, the price of graphite today is 150 rupees uh, a kg. Right? almost five times that of carbon black which means the price of hydrogen or the cost of hydrogen production will drop below one dollar a kg and at that point it becomes competitive even with coal so it is a very interesting technology uh, in in you know mid stage of development uh, there are a couple of commercial plants in the us but there are other newer technologies that are being developed and uh, tested in lab and in pilots uh, so we do feel that natural gas pyrolysis can play that bridge role where for the next 15 to 20 years it can create the market very rapidly at scale for hydrogen and when that scale materializes it will provide the opportunity for the green hydrogen to come in and become cost competitive. 
taking a cue from turquoise hydrogen, which sounds like a very innovative uh, solution, uh, I think one important aspect that uh, came up repeatedly in the National Green Hydrogen Mission uh, of India was research and development. So, and, and there is a lack of research and development uh, in the India's industrial sector that has been, I mean, for for a very long time. And we've been seeing that in the last few in the last few years, there has there have been a lot of deals and acquisitions uh, between large Indian private players and several companies uh, engaged in renewable energy in in Europe and the U.S., particularly in Norway. So, uh, how do you look at the prospects of R and D capacity in terms of green hydrogen in India? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, I don't think it's so much of uh, how much money is being spent on R and D, as much as it is about how it is being utilized. Uh, and that's been a challenge not on green hydrogen only, but you know across board on how we look at R and D. Uh, for one thing, when we um, so the Department of Science and Technology is one of the nodal agencies by the government that um, you know gives out money for. Uh, R&D and apart from that there are several industries that also look at R&D. Uh, we do have uh, challenges with infrastructure that's granted but we do also have some really good laboratories that do good R&D. We also have the premier institutes, the uh, Indian Institute of Technology IITs which have their own labs. Uh, so it's not so much about the money but how it is being deployed. Uh, primary amongst them is not having a very clear objective on what needs to be achieved. Um, much of the R&D money is spent on uh, what we call uh, knowledge based research as opposed to commercial based research. What I mean by that is f uh, if we look at other countries, let's say the US has its ARPA-E program, uh, there they have projects with a clear objective of attaining uh, a specific goal. For example, you know we have to achieve one dollar per kg of green hydrogen. So that's a very specific goal, uh, and then all of the R and D is geared towards that one objective. Now we don't do that kind of research. Rather, we look at in a general sense how can we look at catalysts, how can we look at uh, membranes, etc. And it doesn't all come together. Uh, that is the biggest challenge. Apart from that. There are challenges with program and project management where it's looked at more from the accounting perspective as opposed to actually making progress towards the stated goal. Um, the duration is also a problem. We often are not uh, into R&D for long durations enough so that we can actually achieve the objective. Often the projects are for a duration of 12 or 18 months, that's not sufficient to uh, complete R&D. So that very unrealistic expectation of wanting to see results you know, quickly is a problem. Um, there is a cultural aspect of wanting to not take risks from the industry side. So we always prefer someone else doing the research, deploying the technology and then we have, and we have the comfort uh, of the commercial solution working you know uh, as needed that's when we would like to you know go and adopt so that cultural uh, aspect is also a problem uh, and then finally we don't involve industry right in the beginning as far as r and d is concerned so r and d in industry is very disconnected from uh, r and d which is um, you know fundamental research being done in the national laboratories and the iits so that coupling uh, is not happening but if i can uh, address some of these issues uh, i don't think it will be a huge problem uh, as far as r and d in green hydrogen is concerned having said that though um, i would uh, i would like to point out that we have been looking at the r and d space quite closely uh, recently, especially for uh, decarbonization solutions. Uh, and, and I can tell you that uh, several patents have been uh, filed and approved for solutions in India. For example, we are right now, uh, uh, you know, partnering with an organization that makes small modular um, distributed hydrogen production solutions. So it's not like that it's not happening. Uh, I think the startup community might step up where um, traditional large scale industry has not been uh, able to make a mark. So we, we are very hopeful that the startup community, given that uh, hydrogen solutions are not technologically that challenging, it's really a matter of uh, improving efficiency uh, and getting um, you know the cost competitiveness in place. So given that it's an organic but also incremental uh, R&D, we are very hopeful that the startup community might be able to achieve some of the milestones uh, that we want to achieve. Thank you for the very insightful answer. Uh, my final question to you is that uh, what are some of the governance and policy challenges that you anticipate around the development of uh, hydrogen economy in India? 
Yeah, no. So, <laughs> uh, the hydrogen ecosystem does not even exist, right? That's pr- probably the biggest challenge, not just for India, but across the world. Um, whatever hydrogen is produced and consumed today is at plant locations. It does not get transported, etc. So, one of the biggest conundrums is... Uh, do we transport renewable power and produce hydrogen where it's needed or do we produce uh, hydrogen where renewable energy is the cheapest uh, and then transport the green hydrogen. Now to transport green hydrogen by pipelines we do not have pipelines that can actually take hydrogen from one place to another today. Uh, Although some amount of blending is possible but that blending and then taking hydrogen out from the natural gas uh, will make the commercials unviable. Uh, so clearly pipelines are not a solution um, other than short pipelines you know long distance transportation of hydrogen green hydrogen is not uh, a solution at least for the next 10 to 15 years if not 20 years so then we are looking at uh, transporting or transmitting the renewable power and that's where it becomes complicated in india because uh, you know power transmission is largely a state subject uh, although the the central government also has a say uh, and it has a, a parallel network a grid of sorts. So um, that is where the biggest challenge is going to be. How do we ensure that the renewable energy or renewable power that is generated cheaply becomes expensive when you actually transport it and as a consequence the green hydrogen itself becomes uh, expensive. So that will be the biggest challenge. How do we address the power grid challenge, power markets challenge. Um, apart from that, um, we have not tested out green hydrogen new application, right? So in refineries and fertilizers, we already are using hydrogen, so it's a simple switch as far as the processes are concerned. Uh, however, for newer applications like steel and mobility uh, or even cooking solutions, nothing has been tried out you know, yet. So we do need policy to um, uh, provide some financial support, financial mechanism uh, for those end applications to be tested out. And in general, uh, we need a regulatory and governance mechanism for generation and transportation of hydrogen. For example, if we were in the future to transport green hydrogen through pipelines, uh, our regulator right now, which is the pipeline, uh, sorry, Petroleum and Natural Gas uh, Regulatory Board, PNGRB, is only mandated with uh, managing petroleum fuels. So it does not even have in its mandate to uh, uh, regulate hydrogen. So there are certain uh, regulatory frameworks, regulatory authorities that will have to be established and in general a market to be created. Because if we have to uh, scale up on green hydrogen domestically, we will need a market. Uh, we cannot have um, a market similar to what we have in natural gas or in petroleum fuels which is where it is highly regulated. So we would like to see a market that is uh, uh, you know, freer in some sense, which also means that you have to create that market. So how will a market be created? Where are people going to trade hydrogen? You know, how is the trading actually going to happen? What platform are we going to provide? You know, hopefully it will be a digital platform. So all of those um, you know, infrastructure related issues will also have to be dealt with. Uh, and then uh, I guess you know, finally the states will also have to step up and come up with their own policies because uh, to a large extent industry and energy also is a state uh, mandate or uh, you know they have the jurisdiction over these areas. So policies that enable the central uh, national green hydrogen mission uh, will also be required. Thank you Mr. Malia for being with us today on the podcast and for this really engaging and insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You were listening to South Asia Chat. You can learn more about our work by visiting us at isas.nus.edu.sg. You can also get updates from our research and publications through our social media. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram.